very blessed Sabbath to you, dear brothers and sisters. Welcome again to our season of worship, praise, and exaltation. God has prepared a special word for us, and we thank Him for ushering us again, for inviting us, for feeding us, for filling us, and for assuring us life from above. Turn your Bibles with me, friends, to Psalm 132. Psalm 132 and we hear the words of the psalmist as he says in verse 4 and 5 listen to this psalm 132 verse 4 and 5 the bible says i will not give sleep to mine eyes or slumber to mine eyelids until i find out a place for the lord and a habitation for the mighty god of jacob Let's read that again, Psalm 132, verse 4 and 5. I will not give sleep to mine eyes or slumber to mine eyelids until I find out a place for the Lord and habitation for the mighty God of Jacob. Friends, when I read these words, my mind goes to asking myself the question, am I this determined? Am I this committed? Am I this hungry and thirsty to prepare a habitation for my Lord? Friends, I invite you to join me in this thought. How desirous are we to prepare a place for the Lord in our hearts? How striving are we in our lives, emptying our hearts of all that is of self, making room for the possession of the Lord? I will not give mine eyes sleep or slumber to mine eyelids until I've prepared an habitation for my God. Notice these words in verse 7. The psalmist says, We will go into his tabernacles. We will worship at his footstool. Friends, are we willing? Is there that willingness to go into that tabernacle? Do we enter reluctantly into our worships? Do we come to worship holding back ourselves? Or do we come to worshiping the Lord wholeheartedly, submitting our all and laying our all at his feet? We will go. Do you will to go into his tabernacle? Do you will to be made holy his? Friends, I pray that this Sabbath day your thoughts will go far, far away from these earthly concerns and worries and presses and that the Lord will lift you higher and that you will give your all to Him and to Him alone. Let us pray. Dear Father, thank you. Thank you for the beauty, the appeal, the power of your word. Lord God, there is so much you're saying to us and we're paying so little attention. Please help us to spend more time with Jesus to ask for more and more about Jesus. Thank you for giving us this blessed gift. Thank you for the precious promises that are true, steadfast, and sure. Thank you, God, for the wonderful gift of fellowship and worshiping and singing and praying and praising the Lord. Help us, Lord, to enter your tabernacles, to worship you at your foot. So help us also, like the psalmist, to be desirous, to be hungry, to be thirsty, for God's habitation in our hearts, Lord, in our lives, in our homes. Please guide us. Use us for your glory. Speak to us today and take us far, far away from this world. We thank thee and praise thee, Lord God. In Jesus' name, amen. Spirit, heavenly dove, with all thy quickening powers, kindle a flame of sacred love in these cold hearts of ours. Oh, raise our thoughts from things below. From vanities and toys, then shall we with fresh courage go.
to reach eternal joys. Awake our souls to joyful souls. Let pure devotions rise till praise employs our thankful tongues and doubt for. to us is great. Come Holy Spirit, heavenly dove, with all thy quickening powers, come shed abroad a Savior's love, and that shall kindle Greetings, dear brothers and sisters. Uh, thank you and, and welcome once again to another season of being able to be in God's presence and to listen to his voice. Thank you for joining us again from whatever part of the world you're joining us from. And I thank God for giving us another opportunity to be still and to know that he is God. Our subject for today is on earth as in heaven. And I pray that God will speak to you from the riches of righteousness and that you will see how near we are to the end of time and how much of scripture is pointing us to prepare for just such a time. Thank you once again. Thank you once again for choosing to be here. We thank God for giving us his word and we thank him for his faithfulness in ever persistently pursuing us. We want to begin uh, by a word of prayer, and I would like to invite you to join me as we pray together and ask God to direct our steps in a way that is for our good and for his great glory. Let us pray. The Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for staying with us and for never forsaking us. Thank you for the truth that is in your word and thank you for the promises that you've made and we thank you, God, for every word you've spoken is indeed truth. It is not false. It is not something that is written on sand and can be done away. We thank you, God, for every word spoken it is true and real and every promise made is true when the Bible says, Father, that he who has promised is faithful. And so as we come in your presence, Father, we pray that you would help us to claim your promises, to live by the words that proceed from your mouth. And we pray that today in a special way, you would speak to your people and that your name will be magnified in our midst. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Greetings once again, and thank you for joining us. And we want to thank God for the journey he's put all of us on. And it's just beautiful to see how the Lord, through his word, continues to reveal to us how we are living in significant times. Times that are upon us, times that are ahead of us, and times that remind us that indeed the coming of the Lord is near. And I would just like to invite you to join us today as we continue our journey. This week, we've been on a special journey. We've been looking at the stories we've covered in the past. We're seeing the dots connect and we're seeing that God is indeed directing his people to a very special time that's ahead of them. And friends, to be specific with you, we've been covering, especially in the past, at least, at least the past two or three days, we've been We've been looking at the special experience that God has prepared for his people, the outpouring of his Holy Spirit. And we've noticed that much of scripture is speaking to us about this. 
It's speaking to us about the time of the latter rain. It's speaking to us about the time when God's judgments are, are going to be upon the world. And, a, and we see that gelled with all of this is God's appeal that God's people should be found prepared for just such a time. And friends, I want to just hope and believe that you are experiencing that nearness with the Lord, that closeness to his heart, that deep intimacy that he has longed to create with his children. And with those thoughts, we, we go into today's discussion. We've, we've looked at uh, the previous passages. We've been, we've been in the book of Isaiah thus far and seen how it spreads us across scripture to help us see how God is speaking of the same event in several places. And that says to us something, friends, if God is repeating a subject over and over again in scripture, if a message is recurring, if it seems that perhaps this is just getting redundant, the reality is God's trying to get our attention to say to us, we are indeed living in very special times and that this is a significant time that's coming ahead of us and that none of us should lose sight of what God is preparing us for. Now, with these, with these words, friends, I'd like to invite you to come with me to the book of Matthew. And we're going to go to a very, very familiar passage. You see now, the scenario is going to change, but the story remains the same. We've been in Isaiah 1, we've been on Isaiah 6, and we've seen the same story. In fact, we could continue on. We could go to Isaiah 28, Isaiah 29. We could, we could continue on in the Old Testament and see repeatedly God giving us the same pattern because it is a significant time God wants our attention to be fixed upon. And so, friends, I pray that you please take this to heart and allow the Word of God to, to speak to you in a very special way, in a very, very unique way today. And so today we traverse over into the New Testament, and we're going to find that again, like I said earlier, the scenario seems to have changed. It's a New Testament, but the story is the same. The power is, is real. The message is is just resounding and it's just beautiful. It is just beautiful and demands our attention. We want to, we want to at this time, in fact, I was sharing earlier and, and, and I was sh sharing that it would be so nice at this time if we were all just in a room uh, without the pandemic situation, because with, with this situation, it's not really safe for all of us to be together. Um, but without the situation of this virus just spreading over, it would be so wonderful, especially today, to be able to to sit around in a room and be able to really discuss. And what I would really like to do at this point would be to really ask, to really ask, what have we received thus far? Uh, the question that I'd like to like to hear, the, in fact, the answer that I'd like to hear from all of you is what have you grasped in, in the past two studies, Isaiah 1, Isaiah 6, what have you received? And it would have been so wonderful to hear from you uh, what God has been speaking to you, what God has been giving to you from these passages. Now, keeping in mind, keeping in mind that this story this narrative repeats itself over and over again in scripture. God's giving this clear message over and over again. He's trying to get our attention because this is what he wants us to be ready for. And it's really, really important. And if you've, if you've not uh, come up to speed, I'd really like to encourage you to, uh, the message will be posted up soon. Um, if you could visit the YouTube page and, and the, look at the previous two studies, uh, the first study is entitled Preparing for the End, and the second study is entitled Mine Eyes Have Seen the King. They're based on Isaiah 1 and 6. But now we want to go to Matthew chapter 6, and we'd like to begin there and see something beautiful that God has put in place. Matthew chapter 6, and I'd like to start with verse 7. The Bible says, but when you pray, 
use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. So God says it is the heathen, it is in the unbelieving world that you hear people repeat the same stuff over and over and over and over again. And so they, they, they look at the, they, they'll pick up a certain word and they'll repeat it, repeat it, repeat it. And God says, now, 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 when you pray, do not use those vain repetitions. Now, he's not saying you shouldn't review scripture. That's not what he's saying. He's saying when we speak to him in prayer to, to repeat the same word over and over and over again, it's like instead of opening your heart, we think that it's a magic spell. If I say this word 10 times or 50 times, then the spell will have its right effect. It, it isn't like that. That is so, so far away from what God desires in a relationship with his children. When you pray, Jesus says, do not use vain repetitions. That's what the heathen do. Because they think if they speak that word 10,000 times, then God will have a greater devotion towards them and a, and, and, and a more firm attention to what they're saying. And that's, that's so far from the truth. So then notice what Jesus says about prayer. He says in verse 8, Be not ye therefore like unto them. For your father knoweth what things you have need of even before you ask him. Now that's powerful because Jesus says, Your father knows what you have need of even before you ask him. Now, if I ask the question now, how does the father know? Your immediate response would be, well, he's omniscient. Of course he knows. He knows everything. So he knows what we have noticed specifically. He knows what we have need of. He understands our real need. Well, we still press that question. How does the father know? And perhaps we get something from scripture about this. It's found in Romans chapter 8 and verse 26. The Bible says the spirit also helps our infirmities. The spirit also helps our infirmities. We know not what we should pray for as we ought. We have an infirmity. We have a, a weakness. We have a disability. We have a disease. And, the, and our crippled disability is that we don't even know what we should pray for as we ought. We don't know. The best of us. The Bible says we don't know what we should pray for as we ought. So what does the Holy Spirit do? The Bible says the Holy Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. The Bible says the Holy Spirit stands in the gap for us, offers a prayer, we've not even prayed it, with groanings which cannot be uttered in a language I can speak. If you're paying attention, you're realizing that this is an important passage. You're realizing that this is a passage that's saying to us, even in moments when we don't know what to pray for, our minds are on a completely different page. Have you ever tried to converse with someone who is not on the same page as you? You're speaking of one thing, but the individual is constantly speaking of something else. You're trying to bring them to this right thing, but their mind is completely based and focused on something else. That's what the Bible is talking about. God's trying to get our minds to something. We keep getting stuck with the temporal. We keep talking about the, the now and the present when God's trying to prepare us for eternity. Do you perhaps think oftentimes God is disappointed and hurt? When he realizes he's trying to get us to a, a higher pedestal and we're just unwilling to let go of the earthly, uh, the, 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 the wasting away experience and we wouldn't just want to part ways with it. The Bible says in those moments, we have the Holy Spirit who helps us in this disability, who helps us in this, in, in this brokenness that we have. The Holy Spirit it itself makes intercession for us, prays a prayer we've not prayed in a way that we, which cannot be uttered to present our real need. We present what we think we need, but the Holy Spirit presents 
to the heavenly to the heavenly presence what we really really need in fact we read that we in romans 8 34 we read of the second intercessor we have in jesus and we can see the holy spirit take up our prayers the, the prayers we've not even prayed and intercedes on our behalf to jesus and jesus intercedes then further on our behalf to the father and gracious answers are returned friends we realize that the lord steps in for us but isn't it really amazing that this ties in so well with what matthew 6 is talking about your father knows what you have need of because when you're not addressing and speaking about what you real what your real need is in those moments the holy spirit is presenting to the father what your real need is and the father sees your real need the father understands your real need so it's really interesting how matthew 6 develops be ye not therefore like unto the heathen your father knows what you have need of even before you ask then we read in luke 11 and verse 13 what that real need is you still remember we these are passages we've looked at before romans 8 26 we've been there luke 11 we've been there but we're reviewing again to build ground for where we're going today luke 11 13 tells us Jesus' words, if you then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Now we read in Luke 11 and verse 13, the words of Jesus who says, if you know how to give good gifts, will not I give you the greatest gift, which is the gift of the Holy Spirit? So he says, how much more shall your heavenly father give you the Holy Spirit? Because that is your real need. One writer puts it beautifully when, when the writer says that when the Holy Spirit comes, he brings every other blessing in his train. When the Holy Spirit comes, he brings every other blessing in his train. How mighty is that? How mighty is that so we realize friends that god knows our real need jesus says that's your real need ask and it shall be given seek and he shall find but in the context of all of that jesus says what you really should be asking for what you really should be pleading for what you really should be begging to the lord for is an infilling of the holy spirit your heavenly father will give you the holy spirit to them that ask says the bible with those words we go back to matthew chapter 6 and we notice what the lord says in the following passages matthew chapter 6 and notice what the bible says in verse 9 matthew chapter 6 and verse 9 after this manner therefore pray ye our father which art in heaven hallowed be thy name now what's really interesting about this passage friends is that we've also looked at this prayer in the past but we're going to realize today that god has more for us in store in this passage than what we've thought there's more for us to feed upon in this passage than what we have thought there is and so notice as God speaks to us again, as we take a new look at this passage in the light with the prophetic eyeglasses, in the light of what we have been covering so far. And I wouldn't want us to miss this. This is very key. You're going to find out today, friends, that the prayer oft known as the Lord's Prayer is really a prayer for the end of time it is really a prayer that is a prayer during the time of the latter rain and the loud cry and if that shocks you get ready for this joyful experience as the lord takes us deeper in a very very familiar passage matthew chapter 6 verse 9 notice now notice the context context is key here let's not miss this in matthew 6 
And particularly in verse 7, we have just heard Jesus say, not vain repetitions. When you pray, know that your father knows what you have need of. And highlighting what our need is, our need is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. As we recognize that need, Jesus continues to say, in Matthew 6, 9, when you pray, after pray after this manner, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The word in the Greek means to be consecrated, to purify, to to be sanctified, to be made holy. When will God's name, when will the name of our Father, who is in heaven, be hallowed upon earth in a way that it has never been done before? When will the name of our Father be considered holy and righteous and mighty and set apart and of a name that's above all names. When is that time? When is that time really? Well, notice what the Bible tells us when that time is going to be in Malachi chapter 1 and verse 11. The Bible says, From the rising of the sun, even unto the going down of the same, my name shall be great where? Among the Gentiles. Oh, wait. Among the Gentiles, which is really uh, talking about anybody who's not a Jew, the question then is, wait, among the Gentiles, among those who do not believe, amongst those who've never heard, wait, 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 friends, when is God's name going to be great amongst those who've never heard? When is it going to be that in every place incense shall be offered unto my name and a pure offering? Hmm. Uh, lastly, Malachi 1.11 says, when is the time, friends, when God's name shall be great among the heathen? Think about that in the light of what we've been studying this week. When is that time when God's name is going to be great among the heathen like never, never before? And you're spot on. It is indeed the time of the latter rain and the loud cry. The time when God's people, filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with that final outpouring of his Holy Spirit, will go out to give the final message. Will go out as heralds of God, taking the message, the final appeal of God, to turn to the Lord and be saved. They will go out to a world that will be disturbed by the judgments of God that have come upon the land. And as destruction surrounds the land, and as lives and hearts and minds and families are deeply shaken, they will turn to the Lord. Many will not be able to make sense of what has happened. And in those moments, God's people, filled with the Holy Spirit, will go forth to explain to the world what has just taken place. That is the time when God's name will be great among the Gentiles. That is the time when his name will be great among the heathen, those who've never heard. This is just amazing. Matthew 6, 9, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, is a time looking forward to a time when the name of God will be hallowed upon earth like never before, like never before. Wow. In Matthew 6, verse 10, the Bible says, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. On earth as it is in heaven. Oh, dear friends, let me ask you again. When is God's will going to be done on earth as it has never been in the past? When are we going to see the most perfect reproductions of God's character in the lives of individuals? When will we see a people like never before on earth who will be walking in the perfect will of God as the world has never ever seen? To give us a glimpse of what that time will be like, 
Matthew 6.10 says, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, how is God's will done in heaven? The Bible tells us. The Bible tells us in Psalm 103 and verse 20, the Bible says, Bless the Lord, ye his angels. The angels that excel in strength. Why? Because they do his commandments. Oh, wait a minute. In other words, the commandments of God are not just applicable to earth, but also to angels in heaven. Even they excel. In fact, I see in the text that the source of their excellent strength is in the fact that they perfectly do what the Father commands them to do, what God commands them to do. They hearken unto the voice of his word. Now, brothers and sisters, when on earth will we see a group of people? Will we see a people who will be in the most perfect keeping of God's commandments? Who the Bible describes in Revelation 14 and verse 12 that they keep the commandments of God. They no longer break them. They keep the commandments of God. And they have the faith of Jesus. Hmm. That's amazing. And I raise the question again. When is it going to be upon earth? That people will obey his commandments as perfectly as they are obeyed in heaven. And yes, friends, without a shadow of a doubt. It is going to be the time when God's people are filled with that final outpouring of his Holy Spirit. When the remembrance of sin is wiped out completely with a focus like never before, God's people will step forward out into the world, giving the final message to prepare the world for his coming. Oh, this is mighty. This is mighty stuff. Somebody says, that's deep, that's important. But the question is, how will we prepare for such a time? How will we get ready? How do I get to the point where we will be excelling in strength, that I can obey and do God's commandments and be receiving God's spirit? How do I get to that time? You would remember in the time, as we looked at in the previous two studies, in the time when God's will is going to be perfectly done, in the time when God's name is going to be great among the Gentiles, in the time when God's will will be done on earth as never before, in the time, brothers and sisters, when the whole earth is full of his glory, that is the time of the latter rain, where we studied from Joel 2, 29 and 30, that that's also the time when God's judgments will be upon the land. As lives are deeply shaken, as hearts and minds are deeply moved, they will turn to the Lord with the following appeal, which is the next appeal in the Lord's Prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. Oh, friends, the context just blows us out of the water completely. Like, wait, I, I've said this text so many times, but in the light of last day events, does this text make its great sense? Give us this day. People will cry out for bread. People will be crying out. They'll be turning to God's word as, as it is. As, as we've seen such a glimpse of that. We've seen such a, 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 a view of that. It, it, in, in the light of the pandemic situation, how many people have turned to Bible studies, haven't they? How many people have turned to prayer? How many hearts have been humbled and broken and they've turned to the Lord pleading for God's guidance? Pleading for God's direction, pleading for God's mercies, pleading that God would guide them in a time so deeply devastating and and crushing and then deeply disturbing. They have come out to God saying, Lord God, feed us this bread. Feed us this bread. We need you, Lord. We need you. You would remember, friends, Numbers 25. God's people were, were devastated by the judgments that were upon the land. 
So they turned to the Lord, standing between the porch and the altar, saying, pleading, as Joel 2 says, as Joel 2 says, spare thy people, O Lord, spare thy people. Isn't it, isn't it amazing, friends? Isn't it just amazing? That as the judgments of God are upon the land, a people will turn to the Lord. They will seek the Lord in his word. What's going to be amazing about this time is that this is going to be the time when God's people will have the most clearest understanding of God's word. We're going to see, as we're, as we're seeing right now by God's grace, we're going to see even deeper how passages we thought we know so well God will reveal to us in the power of the Holy Spirit how we never understood the passages as we ought to have understood them in the light and the power of the Holy Spirit. Oh, friends, are you looking forward to that time or not? Are you preparing for that time or not? Are we getting ready every day to stand in that time receiving the fullness of God that he has prepared for us. Crying out to God in humility, give us this day our daily bread. And as more and more people humble themselves before the Lord, notice what is all of this have, when is all of this taking place? This is taking place when God's will is being done on earth like never before, when God's name is being hallowed on earth like never before, that's the time of the latter rain. But we know that that's also the time of God's judgment. The people are shaken. They turn to the Lord and they're saying, give us this day our daily bread, Lord. We need your bread. As they look at scriptures and as they look at their lives, what do they find out? Listen to this. Don't miss this. As they look at God's word, in the light of God's word, through the direction of the Holy Spirit, they realize how far short they have fallen of the glory of God. So what do they do? Matthew 6 verse 12, they say, Father, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Oh, now the passage has completely different sense. As they see how far short they have fallen. Friends, by the way, this was the experience of the disciples in the upper room. As personal agendas were destroyed, as they knelt before the Lord, they were reminded of Jesus' words. And as they went to the words of Jesus, they saw in the light of the word how foolish they were. And their hearts cried out for forgiveness from the Lord at the same time, they forgave others and asked for forgiveness from others. Hmm. You see, in the light of God's word, they saw, wait, how could I withhold forgiveness from my brother, my sister? Is God speaking to someone today? Is God speaking to you, my friend, today? That if you get close to God, God will reveal to you how, how did I dare to withhold forgiveness from somebody? How did I dare to hold a grudge against somebody? For as I need God's forgiveness, my brethren need my forgiveness also. How could I be that hypocrite who could ask God for forgiveness but never forgive those who have hurt me and wounded me? Like Samson, brothers and sisters, like Samson, in captivity, blinded to the world around him, but then being able to see God clearly like never before. See, when he was blinded to the world, his eyes were opened to the word. And he was able to see, oh God, this is what you're trying to say to me. And he cries out in mercy to the Lord. As he realizes how he's wasted the Spirit of God, he cries out to God in mercy and pleads for forgiveness, pleads for a cleansing, pleads for a renewal of life. He pleads for it. Oh, he pleads for it. Similarly, friends, 
similarly as the shaking comes upon the people of God as a result of the judgments of God. God's people will cry out for his word. In the light of his word, like the disciples in the upper room, they will realize how they stand in need of forgiveness and repentance. They will not dare to withhold forgiveness from others. And they will cry out. They will cry out to God. And they will forgive others and ask for forgiveness from others. How mighty is this, friends? How mighty are these words? Just when we think this is the end of it all, we find that Jesus continues in Matthew chapter 6. And he continues in verse 16. This is just something else. This is completely something else. Wait, what? In Matthew 6, 16, Jesus says, Moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance. For they disfigure their faces that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou fastest, anointest, anoint thy head and wash thy face. Wait a minute. Jesus, what, what are you saying? Um... Wait, wait, wait. You've just given us this prayer. We realize this prayer has so much more to say to us than what we think it does. We're thinking it's just a manner, a pattern prayer. But you're revealing to us, wait, this is not just a pattern prayer. This prayer is a revelation of the time that is coming ahead of us. And God is wanting us to prepare. But wait a minute. He says it's going to be a time when God's will is going to be done on earth like never before. A time when God's name is going to be hallowed on earth like never before. It is also going to be that very time as God's judgments are poured out and lives are shaken that people will turn to the Lord and say, give us this day our daily bread. As they go into God's word and reflect upon their lives, they are led to repentance. In the light of God's word and the power of the Holy Spirit, they ask God for forgiveness and forgive others as well. Along with this experience, Jesus, right after the prayer, notice where he takes the disciples to. He takes them to fasting. He begins to speak about fasting. Now, wait a minute. If you're speaking about the times that are coming ahead, Jesus, what are you, why did you just go into fasting and you begin to speak to the disciples about fasting? And he's teaching them, teaching them the important, he's teaching them how they are to fast. Now that's mighty friends, because that's right in line with what the Bible says about the time of the end. About the time when God's people will be turning to him. In the time of the shaking, as God's judgments will be coming upon the land, notice how God's people will be turning to the Lord. To get that concept, go with me to Joel chapter 2 and notice what the Bible says. This is powerful. Joel chapter 2 is speaking about the judgments of God that are to come upon the, the earth. And Joel 2 verses 1 to 11, actually all those 11 verses speak about that time. But friends, if you look carefully, uh, we don't have, we won't go through all of the 11 verses, but look with me at verse 2 and 3 and notice what the Bible says. It says, it's going to be a day of darkness and of gloominess, Joel 2 verse 2. It is going to be a day of clouds and of thick darkness. As the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong, there have not been ever the like. Neither shall be any more after, even to the years of many generations. It's, by the way, speaking about the angelic host that comes to bring destruction upon the world. In describing that angelic army, verse 3 says, A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Yea, and nothing shall escape them. This is mighty. 
it's speaking about the destruction that will come and it is saying, friends, nothing will be able to escape them. That's the word of the Lord. Now it's amazing. You can, you can read downwards and read of the, the, the description of destruction that will be upon the land. Now, during this time, notice what the Lord will be doing. Joel 2 and verse 12. Notice what the Bible says. Joel chapter 2 and verse 12. The Bible says, Therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart, with fasting, weeping, with mourning. What? Verse 13, rend your heart, not your garments. Turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. Now listen very carefully, friends. He's not describing the time of the seven last plagues. He's not describing the ultimate end. He's speaking about that time period when God's judgments are upon the land, but they are also judgments that are mixed with mercy. That's why God says, turn to me. In the seven last plagues, he's not going to say that. Probation is closed. The opportunity to change is gone. Characters are sealed. That's not this time. That time, God is not being gracious and merciful and slow to anger. No, no, no. He's not going to repent of the evil. No, he is bringing destruction. This time described in Joel 2 is speaking of the time that is to cause a shaking so as to produce a repentance. Friends, I really, really hope you're paying attention. Like God's desire is to turn a people around, is to turn lives around that they pay attention to the word of God. He's wanting people to listen to him and to pay attention to what's coming up ahead. Brothers and sisters, did you notice what God said in verse 12 of Joel 2? Turn to me with fasting, with weeping, with mourning. And that's exactly what Jesus is speaking of in Matthew chapter 6. In speaking about the time of the end, Jesus emphasizes the word of God, turning to God with his word, turning to him in prayer, turning to him in fasting. That's the chronology of events in Matthew 6. This is serious stuff. It is amazing what we think is a simple passage. God is actually revealing to us the time of the end. And he's appealing. In prob in by far what I could say the most fam famous passage in Christendom, uh, the Lord's Prayer, which Christian does not know it, is actually an appeal to their hearts to wake up. The end is at hand. That's what the prayer is about. That is what the prayer is about. Oh, this is powerful. In the light of all of this, let's go back to Matthew 6 and notice it's not over yet. It's not over yet. Notice what else Jesus has to say to us. Right after speaking of fasting, notice what he says. This is really powerful. He says, as you turn to me in the word, as you turn to me in prayer, as you turn to me in fasting, now you're ready. Listen to me carefully. In Isaiah 6, you realize what happened as Isaiah humbled himself. In Isaiah 6, as he pleaded before the Lord, as he said, woe is unto me and humbled himself in repentance before the Lord, what happened? He was filled with the Holy Spirit. And then what happened? He says, here I am, send me. He was ready to go. You know what? That's the very next thing in Matthew 6. Pay attention now. Matthew 6, 19, the Bible says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, where thieves do not break through nor steal. 
for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Brothers and sisters, how do you store up treasures in heaven? How do you store up treasures in heaven? Can you send silver and gold and bank accounts and houses and mansions and cars and swimming pools? Can you send all of that up? Is that how you store treasures? What is the treasure in heaven? The treasures of heaven are the souls of men. The treasures of heaven are the souls that would perish without Christ on earth. Rather, the, the treasure of heaven are the souls, the souls on this earth, the people of God. And God is saying that we should be laying up treasures in heaven where, where nobody can steal, corrupt, destroy. By sharing God's word to the world, you are storing up treasures in heaven. As you bring individuals one after the other, as my, as my friend Pashataj Pakhleb puts it, increasing the population of heaven one individual at a time. That's the work that is given to us. That is how we lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven. By winning souls for the kingdom of heaven. These are the precious stones that will come up to you in heaven. And thank you for allowing God to use you to be a light unto them in darkness. Oh, this is heavy. This is heavy, friends. The same, same pattern. The same pattern. Oh, it's powerful. Oh, it is powerful. Let us begin to close now. As Jesus speaks of this time, as Jesus speaks of the time that's ahead of us and asks us to get ready, he speaks of this beautiful thought in Matthew 6, verse 28. Matthew 6, 28, Jesus says, Why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. Verse 29. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Oh, listen, listen, listen. Solomon in all his glory does not compare to a lily. You see, because the lily is not trying to put something on top of itself. No, that's the nature of the lily. That's why, that's what the lily is. The lily is not trying to wear a robe and the lily is not trying to wear some fancy apparel to appear good. That's what the lily is from inside out. And Solomon has to wear this and wear that to be able to look somehow. Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. The Bible says, if God so clothed the grass of the field, Matthew 6, verse 30, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Brothers and sisters. Oh, dear brothers and sisters. The Bible says, if God takes care of the lilies. That that's their nature. That's their character. And, and, and Solomon can't even come close to the beauty of the lilies, or should I say the glory of the lilies. Because in all his glory, he can't he can match. Then take no thought, brothers and sisters, because as you turn to the Lord in prayer, in fasting, in weeping, in mourning, and in seeking the Lord with all your heart, the Bible says, the Bible says in Matthew chapter 6, and assures us, and assures us in verse 30, 
shall God not much more clothe you? The God who clothes the lilies in his glory, will that God not clothe you with his glory so that you can lighten the world with his glory as we near the end? As we near the end. Brothers and sisters, my appeal to you is the appeal of heaven. God is longing to take away our nakedness and to clothe us with his glory, with his character. God's appeal, friends, notice at the end of time, the appeal is not get to know all the end time events and that's the preparation. That's not preparation enough. The preparation is to be clothed in Jesus. To be able to stand in that time of trouble would require you to be clothed in the great character of Jesus Christ. That's what you need, brothers and sisters. That's what you need. My appeal to you, friends, today is that may you throw away the nakedness of sin and may you run to the Lord, turning to him, seeking him in his word, seeking him in prayer, seeking him in fasting and weeping and mourning. And as you turn to him, get ready, you will be clothed in his brightness and his glory so that you can take God's glory to the far ends of this world. Is that your desire today, dear friend? Is that the cry of your heart? Is that the inmost plea? Is that what you want to get ready for? A time when you will be a part of God's people who will receive the outpouring of God's Holy Spirit, who will go out into a world and brighten the world with God's glory so that it is on earth as it is in heaven. Brothers and sisters, I'd like you to look away from your present oppressions. I'd like you to look away from the calamities and stresses of life that surround you. And I'd like you to look beyond to a time that is glorious and bright. Hold fast till he comes, brothers and sisters. Hold fast till he comes. For he who has promised is faithful. He is faithful. If you share that desire for yourself and your family, if you share that great burning in your heart to be clothed in the glory of God, would you kneel with me as we pray together? Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you because your words are true. We can build our lives upon them. For your word is never unsure. It's, 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 never, it's never loosely spoken. It is an established word. And Father, we just thank you because you have gifted us with this special word so that we're not left in darkness but that we can be covered in your brightness i thank you god for the privilege of being able to study this passage with brothers and sisters and we thank you for the guidance of your holy spirit and we thank you god that you are wanting to prepare a people a people that are so filled with you a people that are so brightened with your presence and your character that the whole earth is able to see the most perfect reflections of Jesus. Thank you so much for giving us this time today. Purify our hearts and prepare us for the end. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hover o'er me, holy 
spirit bathe my trembling heart and brow. Fill me with thy hallowed presence. Come, O oh come, and fill me now. Fill me now, fill me now. Jesus, come and fill me now. Fill me with thy hallowed presence. Come, O oh come, and fill me now. Thou canst fill me, gracious Spirit, though I cannot tell thee how. But I need thee, greatly need thee, come, O oh come, and fill me now. Fill me now, fill me now, Jesus, come and fill me now. Fill me with thy hallowed presence, come, O oh come. And fill me now. I am weakness, full of weakness. At thy sacred feet I bow. Blessed divine eternal spirit, fill with love and fill me now. Fill me now. Fill Jesus, come and fill me now. Fill me with thy hallowed presence. Come, O oh come, and fill me now. Cleanse and comfort, bless and save me. Bathe, O oh bathe my heart and brow. Thou art comforting and saving, Thou art sweetly filling now. Fill me now, fill me now, Jesus, come and fill me now. Fill me with Thy hallowed presence, come, O oh come. And fill me now. Loving Father in heaven, thank you again. Thank you for speaking to us. Thank you for desiring us and longing to prepare us for the latter rain, that we may go forth brightening the world with God's glory. Thank you, God. Thank you for your fervent appeals. Help us, Lord, not to hold back, but to respond to your heart to prepare ourselves and others to one day live eternally with you. Thank you, God. Help us this week. Build us and anchor us in thee. That, Lord, through the storms of life, we are found holding on to Jesus. Bless my brethren, Lord. Whatever challenges, trials, struggles they may be going through, help them to trust and believe God is able. Thank you, God. May your name be praised. We thank Thee and praise Thee in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.